I was a gang member. I was a killer. I was a drug addict. I was a sociopath. Anytime that there was calls for acts of violence, I would be the first to volunteer. When I started doing cocaine again, I knew exactly how it was gonna end. Driving to the foothills of the base of Canada's Rocky Mountains is a peaceful and calming experience. But the person I am driving to meet has a past that is anything but peaceful. I'm driving to meet Cody Bates, a former drug dealer, addict, and convicted murderer. Cody claims to have turned his life around because of a divine encounter and revelation of Jesus Christ, an experience I've heard about and one that I wanted to fully investigate. I first discovered Cody on the front page of a newspaper. He was volunteering with addicted and homeless populations in the East Hastings area of Vancouver, British Columbia. And he was trying to help people by serving food and sharing the gospel. Cody had turned from a life of being a high profile drug dealer and criminal to one of servitude. And I wanted to learn more. Cody agreed to meet me at a gas station in Black Diamond, Alberta. And from there, we would travel to his father's ranch to find out more about his story. Even today, I, I struggle getting close to people because I've only bonded with people over lines of cocaine and alcohol. That's how I've always gotten close to people. The lifestyle I lived just came with a lot of evil and I felt it. It was, it was constantly around me, weighing on my shoulders all the time. And that's the life you lead when you choose to run with devils. Cody spent his late teens and the majority of his 20s as a drug user and dealer. But his participation in the underworld ultimately led to a murder. What, what, what's this stuff here, man? Drug dealer commits killing rival. Yeah, so this is, so this is my newspaper articles from when uh, I got convicted of the manslaughter charge. So the headline is, drug dealer admits to killing rival. So that's me. Mm -hmm. So it says, you know, a man who faced a first degree murder charge for the shooting death of a fellow drug dealer in a territorial dispute. Okay. And so that was me. Cody, you're 21 years of age. You're given the nickname Hollywood. Hmm. Why? I didn't know a lot about drug trafficking, but I knew one of the things uh, for sure was to not give out your real name. <laughs> and uh, Hollywood was a name uh, a friend of mine gave me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it just represented um, cocaine, uh, luxury. Harsh sentence sought as gang deterrent. Those harsh sentences are needed to deter gunplay between warring gangs on city streets, the prosecutor said yesterday in seeking a 10-year sentence for manslaughter. June 2006, mm -hmm. you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Put you in the federal pen penitentiary. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened that night. Well, that night, um, a customer on my phone told me, said, uh, you know, uh, the, the other big drug dealer in the south here has been asking about you. He's trying to rob you. And uh, so when he told me that, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to rob him first. And so I called my friend up and I said, OK, I just want to put uh, a gun in the guy's face and, uh, and yeah, show him who's the, who's the boss. So what happened? Um, well, I picked up my friend and we had it set up so uh, the drop was going to be in a secluded parking lot. Um, so we dropped off uh, my, my buddy in the parking lot uh, that was going to be buying the drugs and me and my other buddy went into the, an alley that was adjacent to the, to, the, to the parking lot. And then as me and my friend are walking up, the guy was already there. The guy rolled down his window looked over his shoulder and yelled back at my friend. And right as he did that is when me and my buddy were coming up beside the window. And, uh, and then when my friend pulled his gun out, the hammer got caught on his sleeve and set the gun off about that far from his face. A man's life was taken and Cody was sentenced to 25 years in prison. You walk in the doors, 
what happens? What's life like in the max for you? I went in there with the idea that I was looking at 25 years and that, and so I was going to make that life my life. I was going to own it. You know, every time I went into a cell with somebody, it was always coupled with a massive statement, uh, you know, and that's that I wanted to move up within the ranks of the gang. Um, you know, it didn't take long before I was the, I had the floor for the whole gang and the institution, which means that I was in charge. I was the highest ranking member. While incarcerated, Cody's psychiatric evaluation revealed a possible explanation for his disturbing behavior and actions. But you were diagnosed a sociopath. Yeah. Um, I was sent to the Southern Alberta Psychiatry Center. And uh, when I went there, I, uh, yeah, you know, I just got given my life back. You know, I was looking at 25 years for two whole years, and then all of a sudden just got this gift of, you know, I was getting out in five years. Cody was released after six years of a 25 year sentence. He was sober, free, and trying to work a 12-step program. But it didn't take long before his freedom was imprisoned again by addiction and the drug trade. Anyone that knew me from before, I was the guy that had yeah. no chance. Yeah. I was the guy that, you know, was uh, as lost as could possibly be. Yeah. I was the one person yeah. <laughs> that, you know. that would not be able to c come out of it. Yeah. About a year and a half after I got out of prison, I found myself wanting to die while I was while I was three and a half years sober. I had a hard time being happy, being content. It was it was impossible to get. And uh, and eventually I just got to a point as why am I sober? Why am I keeping uh, you know forms of escape away from myself when I'm in this much pain? You know, and, and eventually I just gave into it. When I went back into criminality, I went into it with a maximum, a maximum security mentality. And uh, when I started selling drugs, I, I did it with stiff arm tactics. And, and I found myself getting into trouble pretty quick uh, doing it that way. You created this dial of dope drug business. Yeah. It kind of led you down that path. Take me now to the end where life is starting to close in on you. The darkness is starting to really put its clinches in you. There was, there was no, maybe I'll make it, you maybe I'll cash out in a few years. There was none of that. I was making a decision to go and die, but I was just gonna do it with escape, like escape what I'm feeling inside me. And eventually it will kill me. And, and I used as much as I could. And the more I used, the more of a tolerance I built up to it. And just the longer I lasted, I started developing all kinds of health problems. You know, my liver was failing, my heart was failing, I, uh, pancreatitis, my, my skin was yellow. Mm -hmm. Like I just, you know, I was losing weight. I, you know, and, and you know, what's, what's scarier than dying is, is not being able to die. I got a 30 day to live diagnosis. They said, you know, you're not gonna live past 30 days. Um, my feet were swelling up to three times their normal size. They were splitting and bleeding, and that's because my heart wasn't pumping blood to my furthest extremities. So they gave, they, they gave me a really a short time to live. Uh, and I have one physician told me that the sheer amount of cocaine I was doing is what was keeping my heart beating. So this thing is like, said, that's the only way I can explain it. Cody descended back into a personal hell where he felt the only escape from his tormenting demons was death. I remember the night before, uh, I, was, I was smoking crack. I was just sitting in my dirty, grungy room. I lost absolutely everything over the past you know, months leading up to that. Um, and, and I didn't care, I just wanted to die. I just wanted it to all be over. And death just wouldn't take me. And when I got up that morning, I said, I'm not, I'm not leaving it in the hands of something else anymore. I'm taking my fate in my own hands and this is happening today. I barely had the energy to go downstairs to get the knife to cut my wrist with. I come back upstairs and I remember closing my door and sitting down on my bed and as I sat down on my mattress, I remember thinking that that's the last time I'm ever gonna use my legs. This is the last time I'm ever gonna stand up. And I remember looking around and just ash and charcoal and 
cut in half crack pipes and spoons and baking soda and empty cocaine bags and scales and just everything, empty liquor bottles and beer cans and like I just, I had, was standing at the gates of hell and I started cutting my wrists and, and as I'm bleeding out of my wrist, I knew that this was going to be the day. This was, my life was over. And, uh, and I remember looking at pictures of my family and it wasn't because I was like trying to stir some kind of emotion to stop myself. It's just when I looked at these pictures, it gave me so much pain in my heart, so much shame and so much guilt just overwhelmed me that it made me push harder on the knife to get it deeper inside of me. And I remember I got that knife, just the tip went right through my wrist and I knew it was deep enough that all I had to do was pull it back and then it was all gonna be over. And, and as I'm sitting there with the tip of the knife in my wrist and looking around my dirty, disgusting room, all hell was crashing down against me in that moment. And I knew where I was going. And I go to pull the knife back and then it was like noise that was crashing against me just went silent. And then all of a sudden it just felt like everything, everything, all the treachery, all the shame, all the guilt, everything from my life just fell off my shoulders. And, and believe me, it was the heaviest weight in the world. And then I started feeling feelings that I've never felt in my life. Benevolence, peace, joy, love, just things I've never felt before, just bursting out of me and then the words started repeating in my head it's over it's over your sufferings come to an end and I knew without a doubt that Jesus Christ was talking to me and and he was telling me my suffering had come to an end my dad calls and uh, and I pick up the phone and the only words I could get out to my dad was dad please help and I just started crying and I couldn't stop. And the only, the only words I could say to him was, Dad, please help, please. Cody's suicide attempt was interrupted by a divine voice and a telephone call from his father, which began a journey of transformation. Only Cody heard a voice that day. But that voice spoke so lovingly that he retreated to his father's ranch and began to recover through isolation, reading a Bible and prayer. So when your, your dad brought you home yeah. um, and you came home, like, what did you do? Where did you go? Can well, you show I us? Went, yeah, I'll show you exactly where I went. Downstairs, come on in. For the first few weeks that I was at my dad's house, uh, we were contacting treatment centers and no treatment center would touch me. Half of them were, weren't accepting of me because of my medical conditions. Uh, and then the other half were because of my violent criminal history. This is the room. This is the room. And so when you came in here, feeling the where you were, what did you do? Just yeah. So I went, or... I went under. So I went under these blankets, and and that's pretty much where I stayed for months. Like uh, literally months. Yeah, months, months. Yeah, about I think it took it took about two and a half, three months for my mind to come to a level where I could actually carry a conversation where it wouldn't be a noticeable. Okay. Some some noticeable psychological trauma. Right. Mm. It was hard. Like literally day in and day out. Day in, day out. I just didn't think I was going to make it. This is where I would do my prayers. I would get on my knees and probably a hundred times a day. Mm -hmm. um, just my thoughts were so chaotic. They are so sinful. Um, you know, like my thinking did not change overnight. Right. But um, physiologically, your body changed. Physi physiologically, I was healed. Right. It was psychologically where the huge struggle happened. Like yeah. I still had to go through that detox. I still right. had to come off the drugs. Mm -hmm. I still had to get my mind right again. Yeah. And uh, there was, yeah, every every single day, I didn't feel like I was going to make it to the next day. Yeah. Like it was, it was all, it was awful. Yeah. And you know, and I kept just praying. Cody was doing the spiritual work to battle his personal demons, but he also had to endure and defend against the physical attacks that come with detoxing from heavy drug use. The attack that someone goes through when they're going through a detox is it's overwhelming, it's unforgiving, it's uncompromising. Uh, it's, you can ask any addict out there, it's the most painful thing you can ever imagine. You know, through your experience, 
Would you agree that addiction is demonic? Would you experience in your world? A hundred thousand percent. Um, yeah, no, it's very demonic. It's almost, it's purely demonic. I would mm -hmm. even go as far as saying, I spent so many years just holding thousands of people's heads under the waves of addiction. As Cody was slowly becoming a new creation on the inside through prayer and study, he would also look to the external creation to see signs and affirmations from God as well. I was really uncomfortable here at first, and, uh, and I was looking for faces everywhere. And, uh, and one day I'm driving with my dad and my stepmom, and, uh, and I almost, they almost crashed the vehicle because I, I freaked out for them to pull over the car because I thought I'd seen a face in the clouds, and I wanted to take a picture of it. And uh, we pull over and we get back in the car and when we, when we come back here, we show up and uh, we're standing on the deck and he says, I need to show you something. And he brings me, brings me out here and he shows me that mountain. And he says, I don't know why you keep on looking for faces in the clouds. He's like, but, but this is something that pertains to that. And he showed me the Mount Head and the big face right on the front of the mountain. Uh, and that's exactly what I was looking for when I seen that face on the mountain. And then he showed me the Holy Cross mountain right beside it. I just, I knew that was, that was God revealing himself to me. I knew I was exactly where I was, where I was meant to be. And uh, yeah, and the peace I had in my heart. Every time my anxiety would pick up after that, I would just go to my window and look at that mountain and just know that God, that I'm exactly where God wants me to be. And this incredible transformation you talked about physically, yeah. you went to the doctors and the doctors couldn't believe yeah. the state of your body. He says, you know, we're gonna send you to the emergency room to bring you down off the drugs. And he sends me to the emergency room and, and the emergency room sends tests everything, test my heart, test my blood, test everything, drug test me, all that. And they sent me back to my doctor and I gotta pick his job off the ground. He said, it's like my body's never touched a drug in its life. So that night, you were healed? Yeah, he healed me. Cody's healing continued step by step in the isolated world of his father's ranch. Even the gravel road near the house would serve as a place of contemplation and physical challenge. At the beginning of this, when I started, I could only just come out of my house, I would make it right just a little bit down the driveway and I would be going right back. You know, as the months passed, I would make it, I would come out of the house and walk a little bit further down this road. It was part of my journey to, with God bringing me back to, back to life. The more further I could make it down this road, you know, the more, the more life, you know, was breathed into me. Today, I can walk this whole thing. And yeah, and I feel right at home every time I do it. Cody's physical discipline is effective in creating the image of health, but the well-being beneath that image has been a long journey for Cody. Like fitness is, is obviously so important and you're in great shape today. Yeah, yeah. But going back um, around 14, 15, 16 years of age, you talk about how you, you hated yourself. Yeah. Uh, is that hated how you looked, hated who you were, hated what you did? Because it oh, man. That, that caused a lot of problems within Cody that led down to this pathway. So, you know, I don't understand. You hated yourself. How? You know, when I was 11 years old, 12 years old, I was really struggling to fit in with my peers. And, you know, like I said, I, the more I tried to fit in with them, the more I pushed them away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, puberty hit right around the same time. And so not only was I pushing my peers away with just my you know, my actions and trying desperately to fit in. But I also all of a sudden just started getting massive pimples on my face and, mm -hmm. and my chest and my back. And, um, and I just, I felt disgusting. I hated myself. Mm -hmm. Every time I looked in the mirror, I hated, you know, and even, and I'm not gonna lie, the way I felt about my appearance was I felt I looked like an angel compared to how I felt on the inside. Another aspect of Cody's new life is working to let go of the desires for material possessions. His previous life was one of luxury and excess, and it's become clear to me that Cody has found freedom in releasing himself from all material aspirations. So this is, uh, this is my vehicle from, from my drug dealing days. Uh, my dad 
my dad took took it off my hands. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say your drug dealing days, what yeah, did you do? How did you do it? Well, this uh, the black rims, the black uh, I have limo tint all the way around. Like my dad took the tint off of it now, but because you yeah. don't want to be seen. No, never want to be seen. Uh, yeah, it cost about ninety thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now in that world, I mean the BMW, and of course you were used to so many high end things dollar wise. Mm-hmm. Today, any use for something really expensive, that whole taste here, no, there, no. gone. No, you know, I've uh, I've lost my passion for money, man. I've lost uh, lost my zeal for it. I've I've found my freedom and mm-hmm. you know, pouring myself into others, but yeah, no, these is but this is this is what I filled myself up with yeah. back in those days is things, is cars, is uh women, is optics, anything that anything that made me look, you know, like the man is yeah. is what I had around me, what I surrounded myself with. I needed to completely kill the person I used to be in order to, for him to mold me, to, to transform me into this new creation. And you know what, in a worldly perspective, I'm doing terrible right now. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> making, making $500 a month at an internship, you know, uh, with a treatment center. I, uh, you know, I drive a, a, you know, a $1,500 car, uh, you know, but I have never been more happy in my entire life and more filled to the brim with who I'm meant to be. I, my identity is wrapped up in Jesus, and I've never been more happy in my entire life. You know, Cody, the first time we met, I mean, I'm looking at your face, but I gotta admit my eyes are drawn to your neck and, and the tattoos that are there. Why tattoo your neck? What's their significance? You know, and tattoos always just, especially when you're a drug dealer, when you're in the underworld, um, you know, most of my tattoos are from prison. Uh, the one I got on my neck, uh, I started off with this one, and then uh, and then when and when I got saved, that's the only neck tattoo I had, and uh, I actually got the one on my throat, and then I got this one over here, and what they represent is I got the devil's hellhound from my past, I got the lion of Judah, and I got the lamb of God, both of them in battle stands facing the lamb of God, the, okay. with a white flower in the middle. I see. So the white flower represents what? The light in my life. You know, the battle. Yeah, the constant battle, and the and the flower represents the winner. <laughs> Cody is currently sober and free, working within an addiction recovery program for young adults. To me, his story is another powerful affirmation that Jesus Christ can change lives and better the world we live in.